um, I figured it was still serving the purpose of where do I go if I if I want more help. But again, forcing them to that page. And again, I'll type the number in four, five, oh, we call them. And then the last one here is just a little one where they've got to kind of fly a little hat uh, to where the different supports available from. And again, I've just picked out a few could um, have more in here. And again, it's just we find again when students first start, particularly in the university, then they often go to the one person for everything, which is often the module coordinator, actually, because they're kind of there um, and trying to sort of say, look, there's a lot of other support available and trying to get them sort of thinking about the best way, I guess, and the best person to go. And also relieving maybe sometimes a little bit of pressure off the, the module coordinator. So I'll do it quickly again, just so you can see it. So it's saying you're finding the module difficult, the content difficult, who do you go to? So we fly our wee hat to the module coordinator. If you want help with referencing, you can't find something in the guide, it's something unusual into the library. Um, struggling to submit something for personal reasons, go to your course leader. And this one, um, structured material, we go to study skills. So it's not long. Um, the students complete it in quite a short time, uh, often about 10 to 15 minutes. Most of them have never been on the websites and things like that, so it's not super, super quick for them to do it. Um, but it's just that sort of a simple icebreaker, taking a few messages from something where there's so much information and, and trying to just present it in um, a way that they'll 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 kind of remember. So once they get in, oh, I think that unlocks and they they um they get into the university. So um we've used them in a couple of different ways in the same like idea if that makes sense so for example we've just done quite a similar one of inter interaction different but similar idea for like our open days so again it's a kind of point where you're giving so much information to the students like you know you can do study abroad you can do placements this is our career service this is how we'll help you with that so again we've we've done a sort of similar idea there where it's you know short ones um a short one there as well but it's sort of forcing them to kind of think a bit more about these kind of different aspects maybe to go away and remember a little bit more and we'd run that one during the induction and with, with a timer and then sort of there's a prize at the end of the open day for who who sort of gets through it quickest um so bang on 10 minutes there which was uh which was uh which was good so yeah no we find it been really useful um as i say i know it's a like super technical and um, but it's been a really useful tool for these points where there's so much information and we want students I guess to to try and sort of take away a bit more remember a bit more about it and and, and sort of trigger that that memory on it so th that really concludes what I was going to say I, I I think we're doing questions at the end is that that right right Rachel or not just now <laughs> yes uh, we can take questions now then you can take questions oh great I'll take yeah. questions then if anyone's got one Main questions. I need to use my phone to check the chat because my PC chat is just like um no not loading then. Uh, is that uh yeah yes please Steve uh, Steve uh, there's maybe one in the chat too but I'll take Steve's first. Yeah, I was going to ask how do you oh did you find that students were completing it? What percentage kind of were completing this? Um, it was almost everyone completed it. Um, it but the online groups, um, myself and another tutor went round the rooms and they were we had a kind of system where they raised their hands when they were completed it and um, occasionally we got a group that got stuck and we would go in and help them with that um that bit of it um but yeah with pretty much full completion i think and um, some occasionally with a, a little bit of help um it's, it was often the first one actually with the finding the facts i think the other ones were quite um once you got to the right page it was there but again sometimes it just needed a bit of help getting to it um equally when we've done it in class it's been in a kind of group situation they've been in groups and there's been a tutor or two there and they've just gone around and helped them if they've if they've not done it um so yeah no pretty much pretty much all of them but i think that's probably the way in which it's been used in that kind of mm -hmm. um organized session if you like right. um i've got another one i think in the chat um how did you yeah, value the effectiveness sure. of this um yeah, it would have been nice to see if they were they were they were using it more. We've more asked the students for 
for for feedback um and i guess sort of hearing them refer to it later uh, is not a kind of um obviously a, a very Sort of soft measure, if you like, and um, we've done a sort of questionnaire about induction included this in it, where the students have been really positive about it. And um, I think they really liked it as an icebreaker, actually, um, in terms of getting over that initial awkwardness um, and just sort of remembering some of the stuff. But I guess not an official measure, but later on they'll say, no, I, I you know, I spoke to Lai because I remembered from there. And that's been sort of really nice comments to get back in that kind of unofficial way. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Steve. I am the Strategic Learning Technology Advisor at the University of Huddersfield. I'm joined by Paul and Mohammed, who are our placement students this year in the teaching and learning team. And my colleague Sue Foley is currently on leave and sends her apologies that she can't be here today. And we're looking at how we've used escape rooms in some of our uh, staff development activities to help staff to see a more engaging side of how they can use our VLE. So at Huddersfield, we are primarily face-to-face -face, um, as an institution, mainly because a lot of our courses have a, a very strong uh, practical emphasis, so a lot of the activity takes place on campus for that reason. We do, though, have a growing distance learning provision, and our VLA at, at Huddersfield is Brightspace. We moved to Brightspace in 2018, having been a very early adopter of Blackboard back in the early 2000s. We run a webinar each month on EdTech themes, call it Learning Bytes. We used to do these face to face, but since the pandemic, we've done them online. And we take a range of topics and get various contributors from across the campus to come and talk about things. There's always a really strong emphasis on the pedagogy rather than necessarily what the tools are, or at least on the outcomes rather than necessarily the tools. And we try and do something a little bit more engaging, a little more, more advanced at Christmas just as a bit of fun, but also because it's been a really good way of getting our new placements even up to speed every year. It's a nice project for them to build something quite big to come and show off at these events. So in 2022, we did our first escape room, and that was based on the context of a fictional new building called the King Charles Building, obviously quite topical shortly after the coronation, and a fictional uh, royal visit to come and open the building but we've lost the keys. So there were various challenges to find the keys. And the idea was that we could showcase how you can build engaging content within the VLE rather than just uploading PowerPoint files. But in the context of our face-to-face -face work, that is what a lot of people are doing. We wanted our clinics to experience that kind of use to VLE from a seeding perspective, demonstrate some functionality that they might not be familiar with, and the idea was that different elements of this could be transferable on their own. We weren't necessarily thinking that people would take this and go and build their own escape room. So it was played in groups, in teams, breakout rooms, and we wanted this to be quite short, about 30 minutes, so we could do a bit of pre-talk, a bit of context, do the demo, and then... Um... So I think I've lost my I've lost the slides. Apologies, no, I haven't, sorry. Uh, and just a bit of plenary afterwards to uh, wrap that up. So I'll just walk you through the beginning of that. And that was initially a checklist. So we got them to just confirm that they were happy to continue. Just showing the a very, very, very basic use of the checklist functionality. Then we have this image, which is in the library. And hidden within that, you've got a QR code. And some of these books have got words on them. You'll note there are three words. I think you can probably guess where this is going. And that leads you to our Howard Wilson building on campus. And that was the first clue that goes into a quiz. So answering that quiz unlocks the next piece of content, and then you go through it in that way. So we've been able to use this to um, demonstrate a few different tools. So submitting text to an assignment rather than uploading a file. We got them to submit why they wanted to get into a building. Integrating a crossword in H5P Lume through SCORM. There's an image with a post-it note that had a short link that takes you out to a external tool, so that was Jigsaw Planet. So there's a jigsaw there that you've got to solve to get the next clue. We get them to submit a short press statement on the discussion board, and we then use the awards system to confirm they completed it. And throughout that, we also use quizzes, then submit their answers, and we use release conditions to unlock the next bit. So that was our first kind of dipping out to throw into the water there. But then next year, all this Christmas just gone, 
we got a lot more ambitious and Paul's going to take you through that. Thank you, Steve. So for the December Learning Bites 2023, we aim to build a fun escape route type adventure to showcase the new Create Plus features within Brightspace. And these features can be used to present and create content within the VLE. These features are the layouts, elements and practices. We use the elements to tell the story and release clues or puzzles which the user needed to solve practices and the practices are informal questions that were added to the content for the student to formatively uh, validate the answers to the module. Um, so we decided to use AI to help with the creation of the content and the narrative of an escape room can be a key part we wanted to demonstrate the benefits of storytelling and how this can improve um, the, the impact of teaching and learning. And we decided to use AI system um, that was ChatGPT for the text. So we gave a rough idea of the plot to ChatGPT and asked it to give us a breakdown of the story. This process went back and forth several times as we modified the story to suit the elements and practices we wanted to demonstrate. For the images, we decided to use Bing and we took sections of the story and simplified them to use as prompts. We then used the, the output images and we sorted through them to get images of a similar theme. So the image, imagery throughout the module was consistent. And I will now pass you on to my colleague Mohammed, who will tell you the next step in the process. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. So as you can see in this slide, so to tell the story in an engaging and more exciting way, we have used the layouts in Creator Plus to present AI generated images along the text and to cut the text into more digestible chunks. And this was one of several methods like we have used to avoid a wall of text. As you can see here, we have used the hotspot element to provide information in a more interactive way as the user clicks the hotspot, they are presented with information about each item. The information from the hotspot is tested in this fill in blanks practice. So each activity reveals a word which users collect and input into a quiz at the end to verify and complete the escape room. We did we did that so because because the responses to these practices are not saved, so we can't track completion as we would with a quiz. Here we have used the flip cards to present pieces of information. We then use a sorting activity where learners categorize the foods based on the information and reveal a keyword in the feedback. And this shows how you might use questions to let students check their understanding of a text and to encourage active reading. Now I'm going to hand in to my colleague Steve. Thank you, Steve. OK, thank you, Mohammed. So we wanted to find some way to link this together. So this particular theme had four different sections and they're quite dis disjointed. There were a few little plot holes that we kind of needed to explain. And so we invented this guy. So I won't play the whole thing, but they're just like minute long videos that just linked everything together. And you can think of this character from a storytelling point of view is maybe M in James Bond or Colonel K in Danger Mouse, whichever you particularly prefer. And that was developed using the Adobe Character Animator. So this is the basic puppet we got from Adobe and just photoshopped him a little bit to change the context, just change the appearance, put him into different um, scenarios. And then using the software, it takes a feed from your webcam, maps your face to the puppet, and you can record into it. And you can also get distinctly lips to um, audio. So it's just a, a different way of doing it to how we did it the previous time using a, a live person uh, doing a kind of green screen thing, just to mix things up a little bit. So to summarize, we used the escape rooms as a really good way or we thought of showing off lots of different techniques in the VLE. The gamification was really there just to make it engaging. But it was very much secondary to what we we're trying to do. It wasn't a piece of assessment in any, in any way. 
We were able to model things like analytics and progress tracking, so we were using that to keep keep tabs on how the teams were getting on. It was built to be to have a bit of longevity, so it could be used in that synchronous session, but also later asynchronously. And we didn't Christmas theme it again to make it more useful outside of that session. And with the hope that people could implement individual parts of it, but not necessarily the whole escape room on the whole. And I'll just acknowledge Teller and Javeria, who were our placement students last year, who built the 2022 um, escape room. Andy, who played our news reader brilliantly, and my colleagues in the teaching and learning team for their help with the playtesting. Thank you very much. OK, I'll jump in. So um, yeah, lovely to be here. So um, I'm going to talk. I mean, I think there's a theme going through about kind of inaccessible keys in this session. So this kind of, you know, trying to find keys. So actually, the, the structure of what I'm going to talk about is actually very similar to what Shona was talking about in, at the start here, the trying to get in to start a new term and start learning, except this was a, a face to face thing. So a sort of very sort of practical um, sort of sort of task. So I'm going to talk about sort of what we did and particularly the, the idea of having a collaborative escape room, particularly, um, you know, escape rooms, they're collaborative within the small groups that kind of try and solve the puzzles. But quite often, if you're trying to do this at scale, you're actually having groups competing against each other. You know, it's who can do this first, who can get to the, the right answer first. And what I wanted to do is do something slightly different to try and model the idea of collaborating at university to these new students who are arriving. So I'll talk through that briefly. And um, obviously talk about some of the tasks that we had in there because I think one of the, the things that I get value out of in these sessions is being able to nick other people's ideas and sort of use them myself so these aren't particularly inventive but they, they may be useful. So um, to give some context the, the backdrop to this is this was um, a, a one hour session run in our induction day for our undergraduate programs where we've got 200 to 300 BSc um, students on the psychology program um, at City. Um, so it's quite constrained. There was very little budget. Um, it had to be runnable and resettable within an hour because you're running multiple multiple sessions back to back. Um, and it had to try and kind of espouse this sort of collaborative approach. Now, the ropey backstory, which will sound familiar to anyone who's been here for the, the whole session, um, it's time to open up City again. So we need to get the key. But unfortunately, it's locked away in this chest here. And that chest has got a, a combination lock on. Now, it should be easy because the number, the code you need for that combination lock is in a card file drawer. It's just on a card in that card file drawer. So, you know, it should be over really quickly. But unfortunately, there are 999 other cards in that box, all of which have a different number on. So you've got to work out which card has got the correct digits on and then use that card to put in the right numbers on this combination pattern lock and open open the, um, the box which contains the key and various treasures. Now, this was run with 50 students per session, seven small groups working in parallel, they're quite big um group sizes but we just had to do it like that um, and this was repeated four to eight times depending we've done it two different years in slightly different ways and we were trying to get the students to talk and work together this was the first time they'd been on campus uh, first time they met their peers um we wanted them to find out a bit about city and university life you know the majority of our students come from non-traditional university backgrounds so don't necessarily know about what university involves and also we wanted to do this modeling collaboration so that they didn't feel like they're, you know, the people that they were sort of surrounded by were their competition for getting good grades or for, you know, succeeding at the university, which some students do sort of come with that sort of idea. So we wanted to dispel that. So across the, the, the course of this sort of hour long or 50 minute long session, um, students did various things. So the first thing was they were given, you know, white bits of card when they came in, just sort of blank white squares. And they were going, you know, what's this for? You know, you create a little bit of mystery. Um, and then you say, oh, yes, your, your group number is written on that card. Unfortunately, we only had invisible pen to write it with. So you're going to have to find a torch somewhere that will show you what group you're in. And then, you know, chaos breaks out and they run around the room, um, that sort of thing, uh, get into their groups very quickly. And then the first task is, you know, you've got this sort of calculator style set of digits. They're given this piece of card along with a, um, a cash box with a combination code on one for each of these groups of, you know, kind of seven or so students. 
And then they have to just shade in the segments depending on what they think the right answer to a number of questions about city, city life, London, that kind of thing is. So they'll go through a series of questions and start shading them in and eventually it will come up with the three digits that they need in order to be able to open the cash box. And that worked pretty well because it it's a way of filling time, you know, that they actually have to do quite a lot in, able, in, in order to be able to um, solve that one puzzle. I, th I find with escape rooms that the amount of time it takes to complete relative to the amount of time it takes to set up is sometimes not very rewarding. You know, you end up spending hours setting up this thing and they just do it in five minutes. So this is one that sort of um, makes them do quite a lot to, to sort of get through it. This was another example of what they had to do. Um, so it was, um, and they weren't given instructions for this, although I would come around and help if they got stuck. It's just what remains. And they've got five things. And then in the first example, six colours. And so what they've got to do is go and sort of cross out the ones that match. So the colour of the office doors in the Rhind building, um, they happen to be yellow and they could find that out if they've either been to the Rhind building, Google it, um, or there were some pictures up on the walls of different bits of the university that they could use. And they go through crossing these out. Um, they go the, the tube line, it's the northern line that stops closest to city. So that's black, so we can cross that out. And they end up with this blue one. And you can see all of these have got numbers associated with them. So this says 0203 three and then they carry on they've got a few of these um we've got something about you know kind of locating city geographically so what remains when you sort of cross off these and the first one is obviously to give you an idea of um what the task involves so the north pole so you've got a compass there you go all right it must be that one pointing straight up i can cross that one off um saddler's wells which is just up the road from us um barbican and again you have to get google maps out you have to work out where you are in london you have to work out what some of the other things around are that sort of thing and you end up with a number and at the end of this all you've got is the back page of this booklet which has just got you know the dashes and things that you see on the right and so the students have to work out that what they've got is a phone number and they've got to call that number and this is the most terrifying thing for um, undergraduate students actually having to make a phone call um, but they get quite into it and they do they sort of they'll quite often go do we actually have to call this um, and you know they're fine doing and then there's, then there's a recorded message at the end of that I've uh, just got a virtual number there and it tells them that the box that they were initially given with all of this in has got a false bottom that they need to um, you know kind of lift up and it then gives them the next code that they need to sort of move on to this sort of final stage where what they have to do is they have to use a barcode scanner to find the book that contains the code they need. So they've got a whole pile of books and they're having to go through as if they're a librarian scanning the barcode of each one. Um, and it's connected to a laptop and it'll either show an X or a tick. And obviously each group has a different book that's correct for them. Um, and they'll then get their book, they'll go to the right page and then they'll start decoding this message. And what happens, the way this is a sort of, so they're, they're in their small groups, they're each doing this kind of separately with slightly different um, stimuli there. But at the end of this, they each get a unique clue. So each group, you know, each of these, um, you know, seven groups um, gets a unique clue. And one of the clues is the card is not green or the card has a sticker on it. And if all seven groups manage to solve their clue, that will uniquely identify that one card out of a thousand that has the code on. If they don't all get it, then they might be left with several and they're only allowed one attempt to open the box. So, um, I mean, I always fix it so that they, they sort of get there in the end, but um, they try and do it sort of unsupervised. Um, so, Towards the end, it becomes completely chaotic because you've got these, you know, you've got a, a room full of students, you've got a thousand of these index cards, you know, they're shouting out, it's not pink, um, or it's got a star on, and then they're starting to sort them again, you know, going, no, these ones we're sort of rejecting. And it's good, to, you know, I, I teach bits about leadership and teamwork and that sort of thing. So it's quite interesting seeing how they interact there, just as a sort of, you know, um, how, a psychological sort of insight. But if they get the right thing, and this is an example of when it was run, this was with a smaller group, actually, um, a couple of years ago. Um, they think they've got the right one and they go to the box, they try the combination. And if they have got the right one, um, the box will open and inside is a sort of ornate chocolate edible key. And the person who actually had the guts to open the, the you know, have a go on the, um, the, the combination lock themselves gets that. But there's prizes for everyone. Um, you know, there's, um, I mean, you know, basic chocolate based prizes. And actually more attractively, 
um, these badges that you can see up here. Um, so I broke into City for our new arrivals. I broke back into City when we've done it for second and third years. Um, they really like the badges, you know, and I would totally, I, I did this because I thought I would want, you know, you can only get this badge if you've managed to solve this. And so it feels like it has a certain amount of value and it's also dirt cheap um, to, to get them done. So that was most of it. But at the end, we had a sort of debrief about the kind of, and it's a slightly corny sort of end of Jerry Springer style kind of, you know, summary saying, hey, what have we learned today? Well, you know, the idea was that this is modeling what universities like, you know, I could have set this up so that it was run competitively with teams competing against each other, seeing who can get there to, you know, get there first to win the contents of the box. But actually, you were mutually interdependent. You needed each other's input. You know, you needed to have each group's clues to be able to narrow it down. And even if you didn't get those clues, just the basic sorting out of these thousand cards, one person can't do on their own, even if you know what you're looking for within the time that we had. I know through bitter experience that you, you can't do that because I spent too much time with those cards. So this is what university is like and this is the message I give it's like it's not your yeah, students come here thinking they're competing against each other and I'm saying look th if you're thinking that that's wrong because if all of you reach the the required standard we will give everyone a first and we'd love to do that um it's not like we've got a certain pot of first and once we've given them out no one else is going to get them the way in which you do that is and we see this you know kind of some years people work together better and they share information. They don't try and do everything on their own. They sort of work together, they create study groups, they create WhatsApp groups. Um, and by doing that, they lift each other up. Um, and that's the sort of idea that this, um, you know, this escape style challenge is trying to do. Um, so it kind of sends them off at the end of their first day, kind of saying, you know, get to know each other, work together. It will help all of you. Um, take home messages from this, it was popular. Um, you know, kind of the vast majority of students really enjoyed it and were very complimentary and were saying, God, do you do this professionally kind of thing, which was the nicest thing anyone said to me. Um, but, um, you know, most students were engaged. They enjoyed working together. There were always a few who would just who'd kind of sit back. I think with smaller group sizes, you get a bit less of that. Um, and we were able to use that sort of collaborative aspect to give a take home message. Um, we found it worked more effectively after an icebreaker rather than as an icebreaker. It helped if the students at least knew their, the names and backgrounds or something about the other students they were working with before they were plunged into the chaos of actually trying to solve these puzzles because they, you know, they were sort of focused on the task and didn't really get to know who the people were. So where these where this activity came towards the end of the day, they worked a lot better than when it was the first thing they did when they came into the university. Um, at least one student found it a bit overwhelming, and this this speaks to the some of the stuff that we we had in the the keynote this morning um, about this was a student who who um, sort of self disclosed that she had mild autism, and she said that this was just too much. It was un, it was it, there wasn't enough structure. She didn't know exactly what was, she was meant to be doing, and that it was all a bit much. So I think that's something for us to take away and think about how we at least kind of queue up what's going to be happening or provide alternative routes or alternative roles that sort of thing within it rather than it being a bit of a sort of chaotic free-for-all which most enjoyed but um you know we want to be as as you know as um, inclusive as possible um the design i think worked quite well because the problems we get again and, and any of you who've, who've run these sort of parallel you know kind of lots of people doing the same thing is when one group's done it they're sitting around, the other groups are sort of feeling a bit less motivated because they're going, oh, well, someone's won already. And it can kind of fizzle out towards the end. So the nice thing about this is the first team to achieve it, then um, they've got to, you know, they, they get their clue, but then they've got to start doing all this sorting. And so that's going to take them a load of time. Um, and that allows the other groups to catch up. And then once they've caught up, then they can they could join in the sorting and that sort of thing. So it, it naturally keeps people occupied, aiming towards that final goal um, all the way through. Um, so I think that's something we can tweak a bit more to make sure that people are involved all the way through. And then, you know, there's the, just this issue of scalability. You know, we're being asked to do more with less and how we can sort of scale this up so that, um, you know, we can do it. We don't have a lot of resources. We don't have a lot of budget. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Um, how we can sort of do this to be as effective as possible within the resource constraints that we've got. I think that's all I had to say. And I know I've used all of my time, so I will leave it now. Thank you for your attention.